Okay, well, I hope you can hear me. Um, I will take over and start, and then Ian will take um, the second round. Um, so, well, my name is Tino Maga. I'm a board member of e-commerce uh, Germany, and Ian Travers is the immediate past president of e-commerce Australia. Hank already talked about this idea, this wish to have an IEC established. And Ian and I will guide you a little bit through the process of establishing this IEC because this is a very lengthy process and there are many steps to take. Uh, one of the first official steps to set up the IEC was a presentation to the scientific committee at the 19th General Assembly of E-commerce uh, in New Delhi in India in 2017. Here we presented the idea of having an ISC, an International Scientific Committee on Water and Heritage, uh, towards the Scientific Committee, and we received an overwhelming response. So several uh, national committee and ISC members stood up and um, expressed their support for such an ISC. And we also had a workshop at the same General Assembly on water and heritage in a very overcrowded room, and this drew international attention, and we already um, yeah, met the first future members of the ISC and people from around the world who helped us setting up the task force for the ISC. Then later in the May 2018, um, we had a preparatory meeting for an international conference, uh, Water as Heritage in Taipei. And there we were uh, participants from five countries coming together discussing um, water related heritage topics and we also set up there the topics for the conference and for future research lines for the ISC to come. A year later in May 2019 we had the international conference Water as Heritage in Chiai in, on the island of uh, Taiwan and uh, during the conference we had two uh, tasks or two meetings on the establishment of the ISC. So there we set up a task force with a core group and an extended group that um, will yeah, manage to set up uh, of the scientific uh, committee and we already set up an outline of the plan to establish this IEC, um, including positions, a mission statement, a statement of significance and also a questionnaire to be sent to national committees and other ICs uh, inquiring about the, the need and demand for IC on water and heritage. What, here, what you can see on the right hand side here is, uh, is the publication, the proceedings of the GI conference, which is a further step in the scientific investigation of the water and heritage topic. There have been books before about our initiative, um, edited by Carola Hein, by Henk von Zweig, and this is now the third in a row dealing with water and heritage uh, as a topic. Ian and I will talk about the uh, mission statement, uh, the statement of significance and the questionnaires. Here the task force um, met virtually and set up uh, yeah, a frame or for this. And then Ian and me proposed draft versions to the task force members, to the core group and the extended group. And then a long process um, of negotiation, of discussion and very inclusive process led to the final versions, which were translated into Spanish and uh, French and then circulated to the ICOMOS NCs and uh, international scientific committees. If you switch to the next slide, you can see the mission statement um, for the uh, ISC to come. I'll just uh, guide you a little bit through this statement. So the dedication of the International Scientific Committee will be the research, protection and promotion of water-related cultural heritage. And this includes its material, conceptual, political and spiritual aspects. The aim of the IEC is to progress comprehension and dissemination of the knowledge and experience contained in the world's water heritage and to harness this knowledge and experience to sustainably address the water-related concerns of the present and the future. And there are three objectives to reach this aim. The first is um, to set up, to build or to be an international platform for interaction between ICOMOS, its ISCs, 
and heritage organizations and the water sector. So to bridge these divided worlds that were already mentioned by Hank, you have the water world on the one hand side, uh, with all its elements, the world of heritage, and we need more communication. We have to establish an ongoing dialogue between both of these worlds. And this includes governments, agencies, associated communities, and NGOs. And here we focus on networking, education, and on dialogue about the significance of water heritage. A second objective is the development of methodologies, of training, policies, and good design processes. And this includes traditional wisdom, which is very important and too often um, neglected. And this to inform climate change mitigation and adaption, and also to improve current and future water management and planning processes. And the third objective is to strengthen the role of water heritage in social engagement and policy making in general. On the next slide, um, I want to guide you through the statement of significance, but here you only see some bullet points. The statement of significance is a bit longer than the mission statement, and I will only uh, quickly refer to these uh, points. A statement of significance is intended to concisely and clearly state the principal basis for significance of a heritage item, in this case, water. And in general, this serves as information for future management and as a basis for assessing future potential impacts. So what is significant? Well, water in many forms is of cultural heritage significance, and so are a variety of entities, tangible and intangible, relating to it. And how is water in the world to heritage significant? Well, water as a cultural heritage can be of historical, aesthetic, and social significance. And the entities uh, directly relating to it can also be of technological significance. And why is this significant of these four steps? So first we start with uh, historical, historically. So access to use and manipulation of water have played a crucial role in the history of mankind. And water has always dictated the patterns of human occupation and the movement and settlement of populations. And controlling water has long been a strategic, social, and political consideration for communities. Aesthetically, here water and waterscapes have always been a major inspiration for architecture, art, and artistic expression. Socially and spiritually, and throughout human history, the presence of water has been a key feature of places utilized and valued for social activity, recreation, and contemplation. Moreover, water has spiritual significance for many cultures, either as the manifestation of a spiritual entity or as a medium for religious practice. And last but not least, technologically, a variety of technologies have been developed to control and use water, including water supply, irrigation, sewage, transport, electricity, and defense. Here, many inventions have been made and groundbreaking technologies have developed. So this is the, the outline of the significance of water heritage. Now my colleague Ayn will um, continue and he will talk about the questionnaire and also the future steps that have to be taken to finally establish the ISC. Um, thanks very much, Tino. Um, everyone can hear me, can they? Thumbs up, everybody? Yep, super. Um, Good evening from uh, Melbourne. Um, we're currently in lockdown and it's uh, 28 minutes past our curfew in Melbourne at the moment. So it's wonderful to see so many people. It's a, very, it's a great treat at the moment, in fact. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so Tina's taking you through the mission statement and the statement of significance that we've developed. Um, sorry, something odd is, seems to be happening with this slide, the picture's invading the text, but. Um, these are the next steps that we've sort of proceeded through um, since uh, the, uh, the events that, um, that Tina has just set out. Uh, so I presented on the progress of the development of the, of the probationary task force for development of the uh, International Scientific Committee in um, uh, Marrakesh at the General Assembly uh, last year. I'm getting a message on the screen that's saying battery is running low. Is that me or is that somebody else? Is that the, is the slides are showing okay? Okay, um, so I think all the equipment's working. Um, and then uh, in December and in sort of, uh, in December we launched the questionnaire that Tina alluded to. 
Um, and that was sent out to, uh, fifth, to um, all of the committees of ICOMOS, national scientific committees and international scientific committees. Um, so the, there'll be a bit more about the questionnaire in a second. Um, I just wanted to show you this picture here, which is of uh, Diederik, who spoke earlier, and uh, Gunich Mara Elder, Dennis Rose, who's from uh, the southwest of the state of Victoria in, um, in, uh, in Australia. Um, so it's sort of the center of the southern coast of Australia. Um, and the Goodrich Mara are the traditional Aboriginal owners of the area uh, in which the Budgebim cultural landscape is located. And Budgebim was added to the World Heritage List at the World Heritage Committee meeting in Baku, Azerbaijan, last July. Um, and it's the first uh, World Heritage Site in Australia that was nominated uh, and listed purely, or nominated by traditional owners and listed purely for Aboriginal cultural heritage values. Um, and I think with reference to what Tina was saying before about the inclusion of traditional wisdom in our thinking, it's, it was really great that um, Dennis was able to attend the um, International Symposium in Water in Tokyo in February that Hank and, uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, he was able to speak about the, the significance of water and, and water related um, cultural heritage to Aboriginal people in Australia. And the major aspect on which the Budgebim landscape has been inscribed on the World Heritage List is because it has, uh, it contains aquaculture systems that have been used by Aboriginal people for at least 6,000 years um, and probably much longer than that. Um, okay, so we can go to the next slide, please. Is the next slide ready? Um, ah, super, thank you. Uh, so the questionnaire, um, there were 15 questions. The purpose of the questionnaire was really to inform um, a lot of the, uh, the, the development of the ISC, um, particularly the, the various stages that I'll just mention in a minute that we have to go through in order to get approved by the ICOMOS board as an international scientific committee of ICOMOS. Um, the, uh, Questions were sort of, they started off shorter um, and then, um, you know, we're just sort of looking for information. Uh, as I said, it went out to all of the committees of ICOMOS. So that's all the national committees of ICOMOS, of which there are some 100 or more, um, and all of the international scientific committees, of which there are currently 28, I think. Uh, we look to be the 29th if somebody doesn't beat us to it. Um, and the questions uh, really covered. Um, views amongst the ICOMOS committees towards the creation of a new ISC for water and heritage, whether there was support. And I have to say that generally it, there was an extremely high level of support for the creation of a new ICOMOS committee for water and heritage. Um, the questions covered uh, a variety of things, but I've just put up the, um, again, I think that the, uh, the picture has invaded the, the text from the one I can see at the moment. I apologize for that, but I'll read the questions out. Um, so the one at the top, uh, question five on the questionnaire was asked the uh, the respondents, are there already structures within ICOMOS that individually or together deal with water related heritage sufficiently such that an ISC wouldn't be necessary? So essentially, are there already bodies in ICOMOS that are addressing water related cultural heritage? And we were thinking of, you know, perhaps the ISC to do with cultural landscapes of which Steve Brown is a, um, a former president who's in this webinar, I believe. Um, and um, you know, perhaps the uh, Industrial Heritage ISC, all of these existing ISCs, uh, they overlap with the, the, the activities that we're, we're looking to pursue, but do they focus on water heritage sufficiently? And the, uh, the yellow bar is no. I don't know if you can, you can make that out. So obviously there was very much, the, very much the opinion of the respondents that there wasn't sufficient coverage within ICOMOS. The second question is uh, that's on this slide, which was question six asks, are there relevant organizations or structures outside ICOMOS that address communication and liaison between heritage institutions and water management or planning? And as you can see, the, the responses, no and yes, were much closer. But in, in the main, the finding was that there, were, that there weren't organizations outside ICOMOS. And the question really was about um, liaison and communication between heritage institutions and water management planning. So it wasn't necessarily about the, the specific functions that the mission statement sets out uh, that Tino just read. Um, the third question that's up on that, um, on that slide asks, do you think it would be beneficial to have an ICOMOS International Scientific Committee for Water and Heritage? And you can see that the, the answers were overwhelmingly in favour. 
Um, and then the last one is whether or not you see any complementary activities or potential conflict between the activities of your ISC, if, if you are from an ISC, because of course some of the respondents were from just national committees, um, and the work of your own committee. And again, overwhelmingly, the feeling was that the activities of our ISC would be complementary to the activities of those other committees. So all in all, a very positive response. Um, and uh, there was other, other questions that asked, um, for example, uh, would the existence of an ISC on water and heritage encourage uh, a national committee of ICOMOS or your national committee of ICOMOS, this being to respondents from ICOMOS, um, to develop um, what within ICOMOS is known as a national scientific committee. So those are bodies within the national committees of ICOMOS that themselves investigate water and heritage and that would then mirror what we would be doing at an international level. And there are already several working groups within national committees of ICOMOS uh, around the globe. So whether they then would be looking to form national scientific committees. And again, there was a very positive response to that question. Um, and then the, I guess the final part of the questionnaire was a bit more expansive and was asking uh, for identification of particular issues we needed to address. And we gathered a, a huge amount of um, contributions uh, in response to that question. And also then um, the last question I think was, uh, what organizations should we be looking to collaborate with? Um, and if we can go to the, the next slide, please. Um, is the next slide ready there? Almost, getting there? There we are. Um, so this is just a selection of some of those organizations. Um, I've done my best PowerPoint to read to try and make this look as attractive as possible. But as you can see, there was a huge range of organizations that were, um, that were suggested, ranging from organizations within countries to international bodies, some of which are, you know, are obviously gonna be very high on our agenda. Um, organizations like the International Water Association, the International Commission, Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, UNESCO, obviously. But um, it's, the questionnaire has provided us with a, a really great insight into some of the organizations at a national level and internationally who are involved in the management of water and therefore in the, the management of water as cultural heritage, but that perhaps weren't on our radar to start with. Um, so now if we can go to the, the last slide. Okay, so the, these are the current and next steps for the um, probationary task force or for, for us developing the, uh, the uh, International Scientific Committee for Water and Heritage. Um, so we're currently developing statutes uh, which are based or bylaws, which are based on the, um, the template that ICOMOS provides to all our uh, international scientific committees. And there's another, there's a variety of other things that we need to develop, um, a list of foundation members, uh, a work plan, um, and all of these things will be assembled into a report that we'll submit to the next scientific council, ICOMOS scientific council meeting. The scientific council is the body that oversees and, and draws together all the international scientific committees of ICOMOS. And that will be at the 2020 General Assembly, which is occurring next month, but online. Um, I'm very sorry to have to say that it, it was going to be in Sydney, um, but owing to the current pandemic situation, it was cancelled. Um, it was a very difficult decision for Australia ECOMOS, of which I'm a member, to make. But um, we're very happy to say that the, um, the International ECOMOS Board has agreed that Australia can host it in 2023. So um, we'll be looking um, to see all of you in Sydney in 2023 to come to uh, the meeting of the International Scientific Committee of Water, Water and Heritage. Um, and so over the next three years, we'll be pursuing the work plan that um, will be presented next month. And uh, we'll also be making a call for members um, amongst um, members of ECOMOS, but also um, under the, the principles that govern the formation of um, ISCs, non-ECOMOS members can take part, um, but it's subject to, uh, to um, the, the sort of statutes that we're developing for the ISC. So we're working through that at the moment. Um, and, uh, but I, of course, I would encourage all of you to become ECOMOS members if you're not already. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to say on the subject, and there are some very interesting subjects coming up, so I don't want to take too much more time. Um, but anyhow, um, hopefully that gives you everything you need to know about where we are with the development of the ISC. Uh, there is a, a link, I think, to the pages for the questionnaire on the ECOMOS website. 
So um, I'll stick that in the chat box and then you'll be able to get to that and that actually goes to the mission statement and the statement of significance if you want to follow up on what Tina was speaking about before. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tino and Ian, for your um, update on where we are in ECOMOS to establish the International Scientific Committee. As you say, it is a process, uh, but which is progressing very nicely. Um, we have a few minutes for discussion, and uh, what I see coming up in the chats is the question, how do cultural heritage and nature uh, relates also in the scoping of the uh, ISC. Uh, and what I can say before I give the floor to Ian and Tino is that we have been in close contact with IUCN, who is our brother or sister, if you wish, uh, under the UNESCO for, say, uh, culture, uh, natural, and maybe we are a little bit more on culture, in, in cultural. And uh, these links are, are very close. Um, so, yeah, uh, there may also be sometimes a little bit of overlap or maybe complementarity, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, the answer is it is obviously closely linked. And uh, please, uh, Ian, if you wish to say a few more words or Tino, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to, to respond to that very good question. Um, I think, you know, as the, the film was showing us before, the the, the the separation of water from human activity in the way in which we, you know, we sort of drive divisions, um, physical divisions in, into, you know, that, that threaten the, the associations that we have always had with water um, is similar to the way, if you like, metaphorically, uh, with which, from which, in which cultural heritage and natural heritage have been driven apart. Um, the, you know, for example, in, in the state in Australia where I'm, I work, live and work in Victoria and in Australia and in lots of other places, cultural heritage and natural heritage are subject to different legislation. They're managed by different people. Um, and we in Western society, if you like, have been keeping them separate for hundreds of years. And I think that's one of the, on the one hand, that's one of the great benefits of an organization, of working within an organization like ICMOS, because we're able to discuss these things. And I should also mention um, one of the, the strongest initiatives of ICOMOS at the moment is what's referred to as the Culture Nature Journey, which is a collaboration with IUCN or, or Nature Culture Journey, if you're coming at it from the IUCN side. And that, that journey, that initiative is trying to bridge that exactly that gap. So we're trying to examine the, the relationships between cultural and natural heritage and how we can manage them holistically rather than separately. And uh, the other thing that I'd like to say is that the inclusion of um, traditional owners, you know, the first peoples, and they're bringing, they're bringing their perspectives to our discussions. They never separated cultural and natural heritage, speaking in, you know, in relation to Aboriginal people in Australia. I, did, I can't, you know, I'm not so familiar with first peoples from elsewhere around the globe, but um, I suspect this is also the case, but they, they look at the natural world and their cultural associations with it in very much the same way. And they can bring that perspective to the way in which we examine and address and manage water-related cultural heritage. I'll stop. I'll talk, talk about that for a while. 